Welcome to Catalyzing Business Agility. This is Barry Bett, your host. And on today's de uh, webinar, we have a special guest from Stockholm, Sweden. We have Eric uh, uh, Sherm. Welcome, Eric. Thank you. Good to be here. And great to have you from, from Stockholm. So tell us a little bit about yourself, Eric. So, yeah, I'm, I'm um, head of the, the airline solutions company here in Stockholm Nordics. Uh, we're doing some awesome stuff with the open source software for Erlang and Elixir. So we're growing the community. So, so great fun. Uh, so sales and, and programming and people development all mixed into one. So, Well, great. Short, short story. Thank you so much, and uh, big time zone difference from where you are in Stockholm, Stockholm, and where I am uh, on the West Coast here. So thank you for being here this evening, your time. <laughs> Excuse me. <coughs> um, tell us a little bit about what you do when you're not uh, working on the uh, business agility projects. Well, I am a father of two, a son of 14 and a daughter of 12, so a lot of, a lot of time spent with them. So table tennis coaching, they're playing table tennis, and I'm sort of coaching. I also play a bit of soccer. I'm a goalie, so that's that's where I spend my free time. Nice. I think what you call table tennis, we might call ping pong out here. Yeah, you, yeah, you're right. You're right. Uh, what like, a great what a great fun uh, fun thing to do with the kids, and they're just at that malleable age where you can uh, you can be great with them. Okay, I'm going to bring up your quote. So from our business catalyzing business agility webpage, we have the quote, and I'm going to read it here. So Eric says. Business is not only about maximizing shareholder value, it is about succeeding together with your stakeholders, customers, users, employees, partners, owners, and the community where you operate. Agility is not only about the ready ability to move quickly, easy grace, it is about the ability to adapt to and influence situations more rapidly than the competition, including timely break out of successful and non-sustainable patterns. So you want to tell us about that? Sure, many words here. Uh, I think I try to keep it as short and simple as possible, uh, but not simpler. Um, I think, you know, business, uh, of course, it's about maximizing shareholder value, but it's also about, you know, attending to the needs of, of your customers, your users, what about your employees? I mean, they need to be happy in order to satisfy your customers and your users. And when that happens, then of course your your owners, your shareholders will be happy as well. But then also it's it's the community where you operate. There's there's an element of, of sustainability here. So so we think about the, the the future of the community and you contribute to that one as well. And I think it's sometimes easy to forget about all these aspects, all the stakeholders, and you sort of optimize for one of them. That could be your, your customer, that could be your, your owners, or it could be your employees. But I think it's, it's really a balance act where, where you definitely should, should, should think of all of them, and then, then all of them will thrive, and, and ultimately you will be successful in your business. When it comes to the agility part, I think uh, a lot of people talk about this moving with quick and easy grace, uh, which is of course important. And we have the whole agile movement starting in the software development industry. Um, but I think also that this ability to adapt, a lot of people talk about adaptability, but I think it's also important to think about how you can influence things, and not only be reactive, but, but have an element of proactivity in there. And that's the influence, influence part. Um, and of course, it's, it's all relative to competition. So, so uh, we live in a competitive world, so it's, it's always good to keep an eye on what, what your competitors are doing. So that should definitely be in there. And the final part is probably the hardest part. I mean, you're super successful, you're doing great, but how do you break out of your patterns? You are in, in successful patterns, um, but how do you break out of them uh, without you know, being out-competed? Um, out of the blue with, with some new kid on the block coming in there and, and sort of surprising you. So I think uh, I, I try to add a few elements to the, to the more traditional um, uh, definitions of business and agility and, and also the combination of business and agility. That's great. You know, I'm, I'm imagining you're talking about playing table tennis, ping pong. I'm imagining that, you know, you're, you're, you know, as a metaphor, <clears throat> you got the table tennis down, you're coaching your kids uh, on the ping pong table and the new kid on the block comes over and all of a sudden like just wipes everybody else out and then they kind of crumble. So if you use that maybe as a metaphor, 
um, in, in business agility. How, tell us a little bit of how you coach your kids or people in this to be able to, to break out of those patterns, be able to see them and maybe even not, maybe not only break out, but maybe even find out what the success patterns are and you, you use them in other areas of their uh, business. Well, that's, that's a great question, question actually. And I think, you know, um, being a coach, I mean, of course you, you do practice session, but then you, you practice for, for the games, right? And you can be prepared uh, and you can practice your shots and you can practice your serves and your returns and whatnot. But ultimately there will be uh, another player on the, on the other side of the net and you may have your game plan. You know, I'm good at serving. I'm going to do these serves. But after, you know, the first few balls, uh, few, first few rounds of shots, then you know a bit more about your opponent. Is this style of playing working or should I change my style of play? Where, where are my strengths? I know my, my own strength, but I don't know my opponent unless I've played him or her before. Uh, so it might be an element of, you know, the first set being, you know, analyzing your opponent, seeing uh, his or her strength, and then adjusting your, your game up accordingly. Um, but that's sort of the, the adapt aspect, right? You adapt your, your play, you use your strength towards the, the opponent's weaknesses. Uh, then how would you influence the situation? Well, um, influencing the situation here would be really to use your strength and play to your strength. I mean, use your, your, your uh, great serve, service, for instance, uh, and uh, take, take to, so you get, get to the advantage and you get, uh, you get the opponent confused and, and sort of on the defense side of things. Then when it comes to this timely breakout of, of, of patterns, well, that's if you think of a tournament, if you're in a tournament, um, you know, your, your game plan may have taken you to the final, uh, but hey, uh, what's made you successful so far, what got you there might not get you to, to the win. So um, even though you've been super successful in, in the initial rounds and all the way to the final, if you're playing uh, another player with another style, you need to be able to, to you know, change your success story, your success formula so far uh, and get into to a new, new style of play if that's what it takes. This is so great because I'll bring up your quote again. So, uh, you know, the part you say about uh, the customers, the stakeholders, the customers, the users, the employees, the partners, the owners, the community where you operate. So it sounds like the table tennis ping pong um, analogy really is uh, – is quite uh, appropriate. And where do the, you know, in this case, you're talking about the opponents. Are the opponents really the um, the competition or or the community? What do you see the opponents as? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I think the the opponents are stakeholders in a sense. Uh, they are uh, another kind of stakeholder, if you will. So so I think um, it's important to 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 keep them a bit off balance uh, and on their toes, of course and surprise them with a, with a trick shot or two. Um, so um, the, the opponents, I mean, they, they are part of the stakeholders, but the other stakeholders, probably you would like to sort of harmonize them in, in a good way. I mean, the, the players on your team, the, the spectators, uh, in, in the case of a tournament, the referees uh, and the people surrounding there, you would like to have some kind of harmonized uh, unity with them. But then at the same time, keep, keep your uh, opponent off balance a bit uh, with, uh, with uh, surprising shots uh, and um, yeah, so on and so forth. This, this is such a great analogy because you play table tennis with the kids, you know. So, <clears throat> excuse me, um, share a few stories and experiences about business agility that you've actually um, done with some clients. And of course, keep confidential, whatever, but we'd love to hear a, a little bit about, um, about some stories. Yeah, I think I think there are some some uh, some good stories. I mean, when when you would like to to uh, I mean, start with the with the with the expected. Uh, you start the sort of the engagement with something expected, and then you sort of win or you succeed with with something positively surprising. And uh, let me take the the well known example, of which probably everyone is aware of, which which is of course the iPhone. I mean, everyone was expecting uh, a great thing from, from Steve Jobs and Apple with, uh, you know, having email and having, having music and, and having, 
having uh, all these cool things. Uh, but then the, the surprising move there was to put them in one device with a, a super user-friendly uh, interface that people desired to use. It was not only easy to use, it was sort of desirable. You wanted to have that, that awesome device. So I think that's, that's a, an, an example of sort of, um, you could call it innovation, you can call it uh, business agility, you can call it influence, um, but using, using experiences and then positively surprise your, your customers or your users in, in this case. Um, so that, that's one, one example that I think is, is, is really, really good. Um, I think also another example would be, um, so how do you sort of uh, adapt and influence um, more rapidly than competition? Well, you need some kind of cadence, you need some kind of regularity. And um, there's, there's a truck maker here in Sweden um, called Scania. They're probably not so famous in, in the US. I don't think they're even in the US market. Uh, for various reasons, but never mind. They have something they call real-time management. And that's a system where they want to have a decision cycle of 24 hours. So let's say you have, you have your development team um, working and you meet every day at 8 o'clock a.m. for 15 minutes. You do a, like a stand-up and you, you solve the problems and you work together and, and you know, act on your deviations and whatnot. Then the next 15 minute slot, it's the managers of units, um, sort of the first level of managers, they meet and talk in their management team and they do the same. They, they troubleshoot, they fix the problems they can fix, they act on the deviations, but some of the stuff they cannot fix themselves. So they pop it to the next level of managers. So next level of the hierarchy and you do the same thing. That's the next 15 minute slot. And uh, Scania is not a very big company. I think their R&D is like 3,000 people that are in the same location. So after four such rounds, you're up at the CTO level. So basically, within those four 15-minute slots, popping the things up to the right level where it can be solved, where is the authority uh, to solve it and fix it, that, that's really, really unheard of. Um, and I think it's a great thing. And of course, some of the things you can't fix on the spot. So then you have 24 hours until the next round, the next day, the next morning to fix it or come up with a plan for how to fix it. So it's really a cool way of, of sort of getting this, this um, uh, ability to adapt to a changing situ situation on a 24 hour cadence. And, you know, most companies to get the, the right people in the room, would take you two, three weeks because yeah. people's schedules are so full. So I think this is a great example that, that I've seen uh, it's successfully very, used. That's very unique. I know some big companies have often in the morning something they call a safety meeting, depending what company it is. And in mm -hmm. the safety meeting, they do things on above, above uh, other things are just safety. You know, it's a daily meeting. But this, this idea of taking the, oh, agile quick cycles, you know, yeah. Um, and making it more, um, taking it out of just um, technology and actually moving it up the, I'll call it up the framework, up the chain, mm -hmm. and then having the whole organization involved. That I have not heard that before. So, um, what do you think the impact is for the for this company? Because you say it's local, local to you. What what is what, what's the impact for that? Well, well, that company is really, really successful. I mean, if you look at their margins and you look at at their their sales figures uh, and their 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 like a talent pool for for the whole of northern europe when it comes to to leadership so there's like a um, half a dozen uh, ceos of companies in northern europe that that come from this from this uh, truck maker uh, so they have some kind of system systematic way to 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 do things so it's not about the the individual heroes of course they're great people they were recruited because they were great but they were also trained in setting up these kind of systems to to help uh, the the engineers and the developers to to sort of solve problems quickly and then by having these cycles generalized agile or scrum <laughs> stand-ups if you will to sort of impact the whole whole development organization and just racing ahead of, the, of their competitors 
you know, it makes it, it makes me remember that here in America we have, and maybe other countries too, they have a, um, a thing called like the best companies to work for the hundred best companies or whatever. Mm -hmm. what, and they have these, these ratings yeah. and it's based on, you know, wow, as an employee, as a, as a talent, would I want to go there? And often it's about the culture. So I'm wondering if you might be able to share a little bit about the culture at this company and also tell us the name of it and spell it for us for those that might want to look it up. Pretty fascinating. Sure. Uh, it's Scania, S-C-A-N-I-A. -A. Great, thanks. And tell us a little bit about the, thank you, Scania. Tell us about the culture and, and what the impact you think the this uh, stand up with the 24 hour cycle has. Yeah, I think they're pretty inspired by, by Toyota and the Toyota way. Um, they have a lot of uh, sort of respect, respect for people, um, a lot of, of this continuous improvement culture going for them. Uh, but then they sort of added their own twists to it because the, the performance of, of, of the track is, is really, really important. So they sort of added that. So they built their own uh, Scania house um, sort of uh, to have their own house, not, not just copying blindly the, the Toyota house. Um, so I think really that, the, that they have consciously worked on, on this for 25 years, evolving uh, and trying different things um, and sort of ending up with, the, for example, this real-time 24-hour management system. Um, so, so, so I think that it's, it's the ability and, and the, the readiness to, to try new things and, and uh, and tweak it to, to what they need. And also they have a lot of curiosity in the company. So, so um, uh, the reason I came across them, we had the bilateral collaboration. Uh, I used to work for Ericsson at the time and um, we wanted to learn about their leadership principles and their, their systemic way of thinking. And they wanted to learn about complex software development. So, so we shared and learned, um, went to their site and they came to us and we were not competitors. So that kind of bilateral collaboration was, was just awesome. Uh, because after a while you get to know each other and you can share not only the success stories, but the, the, the troubles and, and you can sort of learn from that as well. That's fantastic. I just happened to look them up online. Interesting company, uh, manufactures heavy trucks and buses, also manufactures diesel en engines for vehicles, as well as marine in general industry. It says uh, online that the parent company is Volkswagen. And so we know here in America, for instance, and probably throughout the world, over the over the many many decades, uh, Volkswagen has a very high um, quality. We know there was that problem with the diesel um, yeah. thing, but by and large, over the last say fifty years, it's 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 known for its quality. So I can see why they why they own them. Really good. So I'm going to invite our guests, our participants, <clears throat> if they have a question, either to uh, put them on the uh, on the chat, or if they have a question, they like to uh, bring their voice in. Just raise your hand. <laughs> Um, and while we're waiting or inviting them in, um, what is something that you learned through this process that you'd say, wow, if I knew this, um, I would have maybe done something different. So maybe some, some nugget or some, uh, some, something that's, do you go, uh, some aha that you might want to share? And it doesn't have to be a good thing. It could be, oh my God, I found out if I don't do, yeah. if we didn't do this, it would be better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, but I think that what is notoriously difficult is this uh, thing about breaking out of a successful but non-sustainable patterns. I think during my time in Ericsson, I mean, we were really good. I mean, we were number one in mobile telephony. We were proud of it. And we had a company legacy of 140 years. But there were competitions, there were competitors, and, and we were becoming complacent. So I think that's... I mean, always be on the lookout for what your competitors are doing and, and don't take anything for granted. I think that's a key lesson for me in that respect. That's really fascinating. So the sustainability thing, I want to actually dig into this a little bit with you about that. So you're talking about don't take it for granted, see what's going on. Somebody can be successful and not sustainable. So what is, in, in your opinion, what then would be the definition of, say, successful? And definitely, what is sustainability and how long or how short is sustainability or not sustainable? What does that timeline look like? Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, in the Nordics, uh, we have companies that are several hundred years old. So, you know, that's pretty sustainable, pretty successful, if you ask me. But then on the other hand, I mean, there's there's no rationale for a company to, to go on and live forever unless they're doing good. 
So then it's back to the stakeholders again. Okay, what about what about the customers? What about the owners? What about the employees? I think you you should have measures for for all of these stakeholders and and uh, track that not only short term but but longer term as well, uh, and uh, sort of be be ready to to sort of invest uh, in the future. Um, I think that's pretty important. Yeah, two things come to mind. Uh, one of them is, um, you know, what is success? You know, I often ask uh, clients that question. It's different to different people. Here in America, we have, and you know, worldwide, you have AT&T, for instance. You know, if you look at it, you, one could say they're successful. And yet, having worked there many years ago and talking to different installers um, recently, um, you know, the employees would not necessarily say it's a culture friendly place and therefore they might not say it's successful. So I guess it depends on, on uh, how one measures success or uh, charts it on the, on the map and it, it, uh, versus say a company that's been around a long time, which obviously mm. they're successful, they didn't go away, they didn't die. Mm. No, I, I fully agree with you. I, and that's why it's so important to, to look at all the, the stakeholders, or well, all, but the, the key stakeholders being be customer, employees, and owners. I think those are, are key. I mean, if you count the competitors as stakeholders, you need to keep an eye on them as well, of course, uh, and, and have, have an agreed measure. I mean, what's, what's employee happiness or what's employee satisfaction or what is employee engagement? And that might be different for different companies and, and you might track and, and, and uh, define it differently. But I think it's really, really important to, to have that measure and act upon it um, because otherwise long-term uh, you won't be successful. Yeah, and Eric, do you think this is, a, this is a worldwide thing? In other words, it doesn't just apply in one country or in a certain part of the world, this whole thing. <laughs> Best pattern. Yeah, I mean, have, having worked and lived in, in Sweden, Germany, US, and Japan, I think it's it's pretty universal. I mean, happy employees, satisfied employees, that will lead to to happy customers, uh, and happy customers will buy more from you, and then your owners and shareholders will be happy as well. So it's it's like a uh, a virtuous circle, uh, if you will, and then you need to to balance all these key stakeholders. Yeah, yeah, and then talk about e easy grace. That's a that's a term I hadn't heard before, and it sounds so so um, enlightening. Yeah, uh, uh, I found it in I think it was was it Webster <laughs> the, the 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 dictionary. So so it's straight out of the dictionary definition of of of, of agility. So. So I think this, this easy grace, I mean, sometimes you, you think about, um, uh, let's say, the, the U.S. Marines, they are very agile. And sometimes you, you think of, of a ballet dancer. Uh, and uh, I think this, this term grace under pressure is, is also something which is, sort of comes to mind when, when I read this. So, so I think this, this, this is pretty, it's not the standard uh, definition um, that, that many people use coming from the agile software development, but I, I think it's, for me, it triggers some, some thoughts that, that sort of gets you out of, of the, the sort of echo chamber of things. Yeah, I think that's great. Uh, when you bring a, a, up the, uh, the dancers, you know, um, the, 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 the lightness mm. opposed to the heavy push force do, you know, there's mm. another, there's another side to this I'm hearing. Mm -hmm. Sure. So I, I think it's it's important to remember that that aspect of of, of uh, lightness uh, that you mentioned. Definitely. Yeah. We might have a question coming in here. Okay. Here's a question from uh, Felipe. Actually, we have a, two questions. So the first one, I'll just read it. Is uh, it says some say that uh, agile nowadays is basically applicable on startups. <clears throat> In our opinion, is there a perfect place to apply it? Big companies or startups, or it doesn't matter? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a very good question. I'm thinking like, uh, what is Agile really? I mean, if you, if you take this definition and, and sort of you, you tune and tweak it and adapt it to to the needs of, of a startup, you will end up with something if you tune and tweak it to, to uh, the needs of, of a larger organization, you will end up someplace else. But I think it's about the, the sort of the, the, the mindset and, and the, 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 the 
sort of principle behind behind it, uh, and you understand why you're doing things, then you can come up with with how to do it, and that will be quite different in a startup compared to to a large organization. And I have worked in both, so so I know the difference. Yeah, I, I'll chime in on this too because you know I said I worked for AT and T. I worked for AT and T for eighteen months in data sales, very large company, and it, it, many many years ago. And as an example, something that would take three months to be to get a result to get it to get it to get a a cycle on something Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. would take uh three weeks in a medium-sized company and would take three days in a small company and in a Mm -hmm. small startup it might take three hours so it sounds Mm -hmm. like sounds like you have to be um the agility is important and and not have it just be in one way but use it as as a, a as applicable is that what i'm hearing from you Definitely, and and uh, if if three hours is better than than your competitors as a startup, then then you're fine. But it, if you want to drive it down more, uh, if your competitors are driving it down more, then then you should do it. So it's related to the competition. If oh. if you're AT and T and your competitors are are four months, maybe three months is okay. But hey, there might be a new kid coming up who does it in three weeks, and then you're in trouble. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Um, at one of our family homes, uh, recently the internet went out and we had a different older system <clears throat> in DSL. And short to the story is they couldn't, they couldn't fix it. So I'd be patient. And after many days, after less than a week, I said, this isn't working. Let's go to a, let's go to a competitor. So we went to the cable company. We got it. They came out. They had some hoops to jump through, but they were able to solve it in a few days. They came mm-hmm. a couple times. And then the other company which is now two and a half weeks into it, says, we think we have, might have an answer. I said, too late. We already switched. And we got a better value and we got faster internet speed. So I think that's a good, uh, just a, an example of how it's compared to what? Compared to the competition, yeah, yeah. compared to where the customer is. It's, there's, not a, there's not a set way I'm hearing. Hmm. No, this is a great example, exactly proving, proving the point I'm, I'm trying to make, so. Yeah, that's good. Then uh, Stephen has a uh, has a comment. <clears throat> he says the desire for predict predictability trends to drive patterns. What do you think about leadership that prefers patterns over risk? Ooh, what a juicy question that is. Mm. Patterns over risk. Yeah, um, I think that the, the the quest for predictability is is quite dangerous and. Uh, um, one of my experiences as a leader is that when you realize that in some domains in, or most of domains, uh, you can't control everything and you let go of your need of control, you might actually get more control, which is sounds paradoxical, <laughs> but, but it's actually true. Because if you drive for control and predictability, uh, you may, uh, may end up with, with people not telling you what you need to know. <laughs> because they're micromanaged uh, rather than being trusted and, and uh, you know, you believe in them and, and you give them uh, freedom with, with a responsibility. And, and then they will, they will tell you when, when things are going sideways and you can act on them uh, in time uh, rather than they come up one minute to midnight and it's too late. That, that's brilliant. So um, it's, it's it giving them trust, giving them a larger space and container for them to be responsible, accountable, and, um, and something else. I don't know what the word is. Say a little bit more about that before we uh, wrap up, Eric. Yeah, but I think that's super important. Uh, I mean, we, we hire people that are really skilled and uh, we're, we're in knowledge work, right? We have smart smart creatives i think google calls it smart creatives i would like to call them smart collaborative creatives because you know in in the endeavors we we do these days it's all about collaboration and uh, if you wonder what happened it's the light went out so oh. so uh, <laughs> <laughs> i saw a little flash there yeah yeah uh, so that's just a reminder that well they're back it's back on yeah and that's, fantastic. And that's how quickly good 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 metaphor that's how quickly change can happen or the yeah. competitor can shift or, exactly. or, the, or the customer says, guess what? I'm going somewhere else. Yeah. Oh, that's really great. So smart, smart, say it again, smart. Google says smart. Uh, yeah, Google says smart creatives. I would like to add the word smart collaborative creatives 
because so much is about collaboration and and uh, you know you may have some superpowers and and your colleagues have some superpowers and then then you add those superpowers and you have the whole marvel universe of of superheroes <laughs> together in in a team and then you can do anything wow fantastic we've been with eric um sherm today out of stockholm sweden anything you want to say before we uh, wrap it up eric this has been fantastic well um uh, a wise guy um, some some few days ago told me that, well, it's not so complicated. Don't make it overly complex. Keep it simple. You know, do awesome stuff, um, have fun, and tell the world about it. That's simple as that. Oh, great. Great. <laughs> Keep it simple and tell the world about it. That's the takeaway. Thank you so much for coming in from Stockholm, Sweden this, this evening. And um, we, uh, we look forward to having you on another, um, another webinar if you'd be interested, Eric. Thanks for having me. It was great fun. Very, very good. Great, great conversation. Um, thanks to our participants. Um, they had great questions and they had commented that uh, they really enjoyed this today. So this has been uh, Catalyzing Business Agility. Please go to the website, catalyzingbusinessagility.com. You can see about upcoming uh, webinars and lightning panels, which are um, hour-long panels. We have a group and we have some more coming up. And we'll see you very soon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.